Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 582. That's Cinco Ocho Dos of the Agostino Zynga Show. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you're in good spirits. I hope you're healthy. I hope your limbs are limber. I hope you're health hydrated. I hope you're well fed or on the way to get a feeding. And I hope you have some love in your life, if not a little bit of admiration. If you've been wondering where I've been, if you've been wondering where the hell was Agostino gone? What's the deal? What's happening? I apologize for the radio silence. I let life get in the way. I got super busy at work. I got super busy with all the outside stuff I do away from this podcast. I got super busy with just living my life. I went on holiday. I got ill. Like stuff happened, right? Stuff happened in quick succession. But I'm happy to finally be back here in the hot seat talking to you directly through the medium of this podcast. My favorite thing that I do in the entire world. I'm so happy to be back. I'm so happy to be back. And if you're watching this via video, you are seeing some changes in my appearance. Number one, I'm now light skinned. <laughs> no, I'm drinking. Number one, I have braids. Number two, the glasses have changed. Number one, the glasses have changed, or number two, the glasses have changed because I lost my original ones in Berlin, which I'm going to recap to you soon about my trip and how everything went down. So I lost my flipping cat eye kind of glasses. I'm going to reorder them and get a new set, but that was a little bit annoying. And the braids, you know, usually when I go on holiday, I try to um, cutify myself up, not to hit on anybody, not to really score any brownie points, just to make myself feel good. I'm always on that kind of hot boy summertime, just in terms of... Um, you know, uh, making sure that I present myself in the best way possible and feel comfortable with my skin. So I thought, you know what? Why not I mix things up a bit and get my hair braided? I had my hair braided. It was faded a little bit before I left as well. Obviously, my hair's growing out, so it doesn't look that great. But I am happy to have my hair braided because what it has done, it allows me to wear my headphones in a somewhat normal sort of size and shape. I don't have to, you know, stretch the flipping um, straps of the headphones all the way down to the end in order to get it to fit over my hair. My hair. I can wear baseball caps again. Again, like it's absolutely amazing i love it i love having my head but the only thing i don't like is that it does kind of get messed up fairly quickly and then you can't scratch it as well it's a bit annoying you have to do that whole pat thing in order to kind of get away from scratching it and whatnot but you know little sacrifices have to be made in order for you to get the thing that you need and i'm happy to do it i'm happy to do it um but yeah apart from that i've been good i've been healthy i've been great uh, before we start off the show, I want to quickly make a note or quickly make a kind of PSA to most of you. I think most people already know this. Most of you are way more sensible than I am. But if you're not as sensible as you would like to be, I would implore everybody who's over the age of 21, forget that. If you're over the age of 18, I think you should really, really, really take some time out from your day, from your week, from your month, from your year to really sit down and try and get your debts and try and get any money that you owe in some sort of order. Because when the when you do end up growing up, and when you do end up getting older, and when you do end up having, you know, dreams, aspirations to do other things, and you want to, let's say, go out and get a loan, all of those little debts that you've got from yesteryears will severely, severely impact your ability to get a loan. And it's been so annoying. And I guess in the last couple of months, um, which might explain a bit of my absence as well from the podcast, I have finally finally decided to grow up and get my debts and stuff in order and i'm now on a really tight repayment plan which is a bit brutal because it's taken a huge chunk out of my paycheck but i think in general it is for the good because what's going to happen is that hopefully within the next few years or so i'll be completely debt free and i'll also be able to kind of um, repair my credit to the point where i'm able to get credit cards i'm able to get loans and stuff in order for me to kind of do the little business things that i want to do because there's stuff that i want to do there's things that i want to launch but i need to have some capital just to kind of get them running whether it's bank, you know, whether it's bankrolling something on a card, whether it's bankrolling something on a loan, but then I have some other income coming in too that can obviously offset it and pay it, so it's not like a, a silly, risky thing. But the fact that I had no ability to take out any loan because my credit has been so trash from day dot, from the minute I took out that flipping student loan when I went to Central St. Martins back in the day to study product design, it's been downhill ever since. And I haven't really been on it in terms of keeping an eye on what I'm doing and how I'm spending and whatnot. And my... I would say my overall financial liter literacy is probably pretty crap anyway. If anything, I'm pretty decent at like saving money for like short term goals. If I want to go out, if I want to buy something for myself, I'm pretty good at kind of um, 
I'm pretty good at sort of abstaining from doing certain things to allow me to do the things that I want to do in a month, in a week, in a month or in two months time. But in terms of like long term uh, planning for, a, you know, to buy a house, planning to buy a car, to start a business, I'm nowhere near where I need to be. And this is also for me quite frustrating because I've got loads of really good ideas. But of course, as I said many times on this podcast, ideas for me have, to have no real currency because I feel like everyone's got ideas. The most important thing is to execute and to ship. But in order to ship, you need money. You need to get you need money to want to ship. You need money to make prototypes. You need money to get out a minimal viable product, whatever it may be. And that's what I'm currently trying to do. So if you are out there, if you're out there and your credit is bad and you've been putting, you know, um you you've been putting um you've been putting kind of debt repayment things to the back of your mind, you've not been focused on it you've allowed yourself to get into points where you've got bailiffs knocking at your door you're getting red letters through the boxes whatever it may be don't let that happen to you please make sure you get on top of it as sooner the better i wish i got on top of this for myself a few years before because from what i've been able to see i can possibly get debt free within five years which is no time at all that's going to go by an absolute blip so the fact that i can rid myself of any crazy letters coming through my letterbox or the ability to you know i can improve my ability to take out a loan in only five years is super super annoying because it means that i wasted so much time in the past just fucking around and putting stuff you know in the back of my mind and not really putting it in a priority so if you can and you have the time and you're able to or you're thinking about you know improving your prospects in life whatever it may be i do employ you to try your best to get rid of all the debts that you have or the money that you owe or get back on some type of repayment plan so you can show that you are at least trying to pay off the money that you owe because if not it's going to fall around like a bad smell and you're not going to be able to do the things that you actually want to do so please make sure you do it if you haven't already i'm doing that at the moment and i have to be honest it's probably the best decision i've made in a long time in many many years it's been a business i've ever made it's a big weight off my shoulders i legitimately was walking down the street skipping um i legitimately had a smile on my face do you know what i mean i was really really happy at the end of the call and it's something that i was dreading i was actually dreading to get on the phone i was dreading to sort it out i was dreading to explain my situation all that sort of stuff but the fact that i got it out of the way and i finally got put on some sort of plan has finally got me on the road to be debt free and also on the road to allow myself to improve my credit and to start doing the things that i actually want to do with whatever Ever avenues or funding that opens up after i end up finishing that so make sure if you haven't um kind of done that before i do employ you to do so apart from that i also what i do i went to berlin of course i visited Berghain, of course and i just have some thoughts and opinions about visiting berlin about going to Berghain, and just generally the techno community people that i met out there who kind of left a bit of a sour taste in my mouth i'm not going to lie i'm not going to lie there's a sour taste in my mouth first of all we'll start off with a trip when it comes to going when it comes to berlin trips or european trips i always kind of opt for low budget you know airlines such as ryanair they're quick they're easy to use um you know it's a fairly simple process to buy a ticket online it's a fairly simple process to arrive at the airport to get through immigration to get through the scanning whatever it may be it's super simple and standard airport is a really easy airport to navigate um etc 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 one thing that i was a big revelation to me for this trip was number one i went and took with me check-in luggage which i never usually do i usually always take carry-on luggage with the understanding or in the hopes that it would improve my chances of getting out of the plane and out of the airport and to my destination quicker or to my occupation to my accommodation that i have and then f to allow me to then go out and party but really and truly after this trip what i've realized is that there is no real time difference of you leaving the airport between you checking in your bag or between you getting the, your own bag and carrying it onto the plane and put it into the overhead compartments there's no difference you all leave the plane at the same time because because it's a budget low-cost airline they usually park them in some crazy area of the airport anyway so you have to travel all the way there to get there like inside the airport right walking all the way there air, you know escalators lifts whatever it may be then once you're there they only stay there for a short period of time then but they make you wait longer than the period of time that they're meant to be staying there then once you get to the other airport you also park and arrive there at a mad distance a mad distance away from what, where everyone else is which means you don't have to wait for them to get ready and unpack your stuff and then by the time the luggage point check-in 
it gets put onto the car to then put onto the carousel and by the time everyone's left the plane you effectively all leave at the same time there is no difference it really isn't the only time i can see any kind of reason why you'd want to take a carry-on luggage those kind of trips will be because you've obviously traveled light and also because you might have you know you might be meeting some legitimate friends out there in you know in whatever country you're visiting and maybe because they're waiting for you at an airport there's a limited time that they can wait for you in that particular parking spot so maybe having the ability to really run and get at the airport as soon as quickly as soon as possible sorry is a real big sort of a deal to a lot of people but i can definitely say checking luggage v carrying luggage no difference the other benefit between taking check-in luggage as well is that you have the ability from me anyway because i'm a bit of a you know I'm a little bit of a, um, of a self-care advocate. I was able to take all my moisturizers, all my hair creams, all my body lotions, whatever, right? All my hand creams, all my perfumes, my anti-perspirant anti spray, whatever. All that stuff I was able to take with me and just dump in my check-in luggage because you can take that liquids and whatnot, whatever sides in that sort of uh, luggage. So it was super, super, super convenient that way. Because usually when I do go to Berlin, I do have a little bit of a tradition where when I arrive, the first thing I like to do is to kind of, you know, put my shit down, maybe shower and then go straight out to a Rossman, which is effectively their version of like a boots and then go buy all my toiletries that I need for the trip there. But then usually what happens is that when I buy my toiletries, I end up using only half of it and leaving it all there. So you kind of waste money because you can't exactly take them back because I'm buying like regular kind of shower gel size kind of you know bottles or whatnot and i think the max you could take on a plane is like 100 millimeters so um millil milliliters sorry so that was the m two first things i realized there uh try and take checking luggage if you can because it's more convenient and it makes it easy to travel because you only if you especially if you're just taking a backpack you're going and you have a checking luggage in your backpack it's easy to, to carry around and then of course secondly i feel like the ability to take your kind of you know toiletries and stuff is second to none and i'd much rather do that and then the other thing i discovered also that was also a bit of a, a eye opener was that i much prefer going to the airport on the train with the standard express which basically gets there in like half an hour 40 minutes from where i live but beforehand i was used to take this coach and it's national specs national express coach sorry that would go from like london all the way to like Stansted. And that coach at the time beforehand was really a good deal because I think it took like 50 minutes to go. And usually if, you, if you've got a plane that leaves the UK before 12 a.m. or 12 p.m., sorry, there's a chance that you could get to the airport in sometimes under the 50 minutes because it's not going to be that much traffic, isn't it, right? So just make sure you don't book in the evening. And then, of course, the coach was way more cheaper to get to the airport than anything else. I think you know, at the time that I used to go, it must have been like anywhere between like 10 to 13 pounds, whereas Ubers and taxis were like, I think, 100 pounds to get to the airport. And then, of course, the, the, um, the train at the time was like 40. And then later on over time, I started to realise that coaches of course are horrible to be on that kind of journey because you're sweating left and right making you sick the smell of that upholstery or air freshener or whatever the smell coaches have makes me legitimately want to bath and then also in terms of convenience being able to just take your train your, your luggage on the, on the train put it where they put all the luggages and shit and just shit, shit, sit down and relax and be able to charge your phone is something that i will treasure for the rest of my life do you know what i mean and it's definitely been a big game changer for my traveling um procedure that i do so definitely going forward i'll definitely make sure when i'm budgeting for my spending money that i have it included my ticket to go there and there and back from the stansted airport because you know the, 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 there's no way that i'm not going to do that again going forward i'm not going to do the whole country again because it's just miserable anyway that aside moving on in so obviously the trip that I went to, the primary reason to go there was to, of course, visit Berghain for their special Sylvester Club Night, Club Night, sorry, um, uh, for 2020, for 2020 to 2022. I'm still a bit miffed and confused as to why they decided to throw a makeup New Year's Eve slash New Year's Day party in the, in the, at the beginning of June. It still doesn't make any sense to me. I know they missed out on it because of the pandemic. So they've kind of not been open, I think, for maybe two and a half years, it feels like. And then maybe this was just their way to kind of try to um, maybe get some money back in a till. I don't really know. But I don't really see the sense of doing a makeup January rave in June. It just doesn't make any sense. Unless there's another tie-in with the date that I'm not really aware of. So if there is that thing and you know it and you're knowledgeable of it, please leave me a comment down below. So... That's the main point of going there. And then the other point of going there also is that I also wanted to check out RSO Berlin. RSO Berlin has been, is now basically the official 
um, rebirth of Griezmüller, a really famous club that I used to love in Berlin that unfortunately closed down due to renovation work or whatnot. No, due to... Um, due to, uh, you know, the usual stuff, fucking gentrification and whatnot, right? And, and then they obviously moved into a new site and now their kind of fully-fledged club is this place called RSO. And I've been told it's got an amazing sound system. It's really well-designed. There's an outdoor area to chill in. It's just a great club to be in. And of course, seeing it's Berlin, you don't see any pictures and stuff. I wanted to see it stuff in my real eyes. So the first thing I wanted to do was to check out Berghain. Of course, we go to RSO. And then lastly, the other option or the other reason why I wanted to go out there was to check out this place called Same Heads, which is a sort of, what would you say, a quote-unquote alternative anything but techno kind of space in the middle of Neukölln that everyone kind of has a lot of great things to say about and I also wanted to check out because it would be something different than you you know listen to the same old oots 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 the whole entire weekend so number one um I have to say off off rip I think I might be done with Bergheim and I think I might be done with Berlin overall especially for the next year or so because if you guys are aware, if you've been listening to the podcast, you would know that I have visited Berlin sometimes four times in a year. And I, but the main thing I try to do is to keep it to like one to twice per year. And being a fan of techno, being a fan of club culture, um, being a fan of DJs in general, the obviously the best place, the pinnacle, the top tier, the pièce de résistance of club culture in general is obviously Berlin. They do it the best there. They take it very seriously. And if you really want to experience it in its fully fledged form, that's the best place to go. Especially if you're just gonna go there for like a you know a techno weekender, I definitely recommend to go there because you can't go wrong. With regards to the club you go to, except if you go to like Matrix, every club is absolutely insane and great in their own way. But a part of me also thinks that maybe I've got too close to the sun and I'm now starting to build up a little bit of animosity and hatred around the people that frequent that place because I did leave Berkheim this time around with a little bit of a distasteful taste in my mouth concerning everything that goes on around it. First of all, the queue. Number one, the queue. Obviously, it being my fault. The plan originally was for me to get there on Saturday evening, sometime around 9 to 10 p.m., queue up, before the doors opened on that Saturday, be able to get in, listen to a couple of people play, get my get my um get my wristband of course. So then it allowed me the opportunity to come back on the Sunday evening and be able to cut the queue and get in because I already got a ticket. But I didn't do that. I left it until Sunday. So I arrived there on Sunday evening, and then of course I get there late for what I went to get there for. I arrived there, let's say like I think I arrived there like half eight or something. And the queue at half eight was like, let's say, towards the end of the metal barriers, like the the actual, sh not the metal snake thing, but the other barriers are put towards the end of it. So just before it gets to the one of the kind of kiosk, right there. So it took me. So that's where I was. We didn't move from that section of that queue until like twelve or eleven thirty at night. So three and a half hours. That queue didn't really move too much. And then by the time we did get in, I think it must have been like, you know quarter to one or something wherever it may be so we probably waited outside for around four hours just to get inside crazy and of course when you're waiting in a Bergheim queue there is no guarantee you're going to get in and they don't do that thing that other clubs do sometimes where if the queue is really monstrous and everyone's waiting to go in they'll just have somebody walk down the line and just tell people hey you're probably not going to get him as well go home you know what I mean they, all they had was one guy come down and say hey the club is over capacity. We're going to be letting people in one one in, one out or something. I think it's something like along, along the lines of. But they just let you, they basically leave you, into, leave you in the queue and they only make the decision about whether they're going to let you in or not once you get to the front of the door, which I thought was a little bit out of order, especially considering the party it was. It was like a New Year's Day party. It was a really hyped one. It was a public holiday. Uh, it was a bank holiday weekend. All that good stuff was happening. And I just think because it was so random, people were so excited to go. It would have been nice for the people that I was around, some of them who didn't get in, who were waiting just as long as I was, four and a half hours, whatnot, to get right to the door and then be told no. I just think it would be nice if they had the ability to be like, hey, you're not going to happen for you tonight. It's really busy. Maybe you come back next month, next year, whatever it may be, but zip. So you can just leave and carry on doing your other thing. Obviously, the other kind of slight 
good thing about Bergheim is that, or Berlin in general, is that if you do get rejected from there, there's plenty of other clubs within a five mile radius you can go to. So it's not like they ruin your night. And it is you deciding of your own volition to go wait there outside four hours. No one's telling you to do so. So whatever. It is what it is. You go in, you do your thing. When I was in there and I was having a great time, I enjoyed all the DJs that I saw that were playing. Um, I ended up speaking to a couple, such as, Ju not speaking, but saying hi to Juliana Huxtable, who, you know, didn't really seem like they were too happy to, for me to say hi to them. But still, I did because I'm a fan. Hey, I love what you do. Keep it moving. But I don't advise you to do it because I just feel like people in general are a bit weird whenever people, I don't know, maybe it's just me and the way I come across. I don't really know. Whatever it is. She didn't seem that pleased for me to say hi. But regardless, I did it anyway. Then I saw Gerd Jansen, who unfortunately I missed because I did want to see him because I was outside in the queue for fucking four and a half hours. But then I did see him on the inside and I was able to shake his hand and tell him how great I think he is and obviously compliment him on his DJ skills because I listened to it outside in the queue. All good, all good, all good. One thing I noticed quite quickly, and I think this is because I was pretty sober and I had only maybe a couple of beers in me, which again, I don't recommend, especially if you're like me and you think you can drink beer, but you can't. And you get constipated and you want to shit, but you can't shit because there's nothing in there because it's all gas. But we move, we progress. I realized quite quickly, a lot of people that go to that space, for the most part, from what I saw, most, most of the reason they go there is an excuse to get fucked up and just an excuse to like, be sociable and to look cool. I didn't really see a lot of people that I felt like I bumped into around there who necess who like gave a shit about who was playing. Like it felt like a lot of them were just there to be seen. It's kind of turned into like a sceney, let me kind of put my face there, be it. You know what I mean? It was a bit strange. Whereas I legitimately looked at this lineup and thought, wow, this is such a great time to go because it's kind of two, killing two birds with one stone because they've got all the great people playing. It's a special night and I can see them all in one time. Do you know what I mean? Like I can see all these amazing people who maybe be spread out across four lineups all on one. But I think that a lot of people that went there were just went there because it was a cool place to be seen at the time. It was a bank holiday weekend, a lot of good people playing, a lot of interesting people coming into the space, blah, blah, blah. So that was odd and that was weird and that was strange overall. And then in general, I just felt like the attitude of people that I met in there was just so despicable in terms of that kind of like um, sense of ownership that they weirdly have with a club and with a scene that they have not contributed nothing to in the slightest. And I don't understand where it comes from. I don't understand where this kind of unearned sense of confidence and entitlement comes from. I really do not. I can't get it out of my head how some people's attitudes were so stinky that it kind of made me think like, what do you actually do apart from get dressed up like a flipping, um, you know, cerebral palsy laden techno ninja right get it up to your eyeballs and attend parties and work in bars like, what do you actually do in this scene and i don't understand it because uh, there was a period there's a period in my t life where i was coming up in london and i wanted to be a part of the you know the nightlife scene here and i would do my club nights and i'd go and dj and i'd go to other people's club nights and i'd go to art gallery evenings and i'd go to record store launches and i'd go out on record store day i'd be around i'd be in the mix but like at different things it wasn't just all raves it was just like sometimes it'd be like a panel discussion thing it would be like a book signing whatever it may be just to kind of be in and amongst the mix but ultimately i wanted to do things to get me involved whether it was taking pictures making zines trying to design t-shirts putting on parties like i tried to do something starting a brand all of it was trying to get involved so that i could have so that i could be i could kind of put my notch on the kind of cultural timeline of that place that i was at, at the moment i at that given time whereas over there it feels like people are just like they feel as if like they are a part of it and they've done something just because they're going out and they have a real big ego about it like they were going on and carrying themselves that like they were fucking kanye without any of the work to back it up and i just couldn't understand it because i'm somebody who has real delusional self-confidence right in terms of what i believe i can do and the levels that i can achieve but most of my delusion comes from my god-given belief and actual evidence that i have in hand that i think i'm better than a lot of people but it's because the evidence is there these guys don't have any evidence and they think they're better than everyone i don't understand it and it really gives a weird vibe when you're in there because I felt like those spaces in general, techno clubs in general, nightlife in general, overall, for the most part, should be an excuse to take drugs, to get really drunk, to dance a lot, to maybe meet some interesting people, hear some cool DJs play some cool music, and then go home. 
That's all I thought it was. I, I never ever felt like it was anything more than that. And if you want to make it more than that, you can by participating. You start your own club night, you open your own club, you start your own brand of liquor, whatever it may be to participate, you do it. You become a door person, you start designing flyers. It doesn't matter if you want to take it a step further. But if you just want to be a punter and just buy tickets and attend stuff, the joy of it is just be able to go in to get high, get drunk, dance, you know, maybe pick up somebody, maybe not, maybe make some friends and then go home. It wasn't like you were walking in there acting as if you owned the place just because you go there quite often. I do not understand that personality is so utterly, utterly, utterly bizarre. Really, really bizarre. And it really did grind my gears. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. And then, of course, of course, my favorite subject in it was this kind of, and I think I mentioned it to a couple of black guys that I was in there speaking, especially the older types, who I felt like were way more um, friendly than the younger ones. But there was a, re there's a really strange vibe. And again, maybe it's just me from being a tourist. I haven't lived there. Like some dumb, 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 dummy told me actually once I was in there. And actually, I just laughed it off and pretended like it made sense. But I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? They're like, oh, um, trust me, living here is far different than coming here as a tourist. I was like, really? From being a London, you think there's a big difference between what you do here day to day and what we do in London day to day. It's that different to you, yeah? All right, cool. Safe. And as well, like, you know what I mean? Framing your whole personality around techno, really? Really? Your whole personality is based around wearing... But And again, that's not a personality. Just adopting a uniform that you're just wearing to wear all black. You're going to wear double sole Dr. Martin boots. You're going to wear black bikinis in the club, fishnets all the time. That isn't a personality. That doesn't make you interesting. That's a uniform anyone and everyone could do. Just go on any popular you know, techno Instagram page, copy what someone's wearing and go, and no one will be able to tell the difference between you, somebody that just copied the outfit from Instagram, and somebody that's been going to Berlin and Bergheim for flipping seven plus years, as someone told me. It doesn't really matter. It's not that big of a deal. But anyway, going back to the point I was going to make, there's a really strange vibe around some of the black people that live and breathe that whole techno scene in Berlin, I feel like. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just, again, maybe it's just me projecting. Maybe it's me projecting my own insecurities. And maybe I'm the one that's giving the bad vibes. I'm putting a disclaimer out there. But in general, I've felt like I've come across, the. I've had the worst interactions with people who looked like me over there because I felt like, reading into it again without even speaking to them and, and trying to read into their minds which is bizarre and dumb but i'm attempting to because the podcast i'm allowed to chat shit it felt like they wanted to be the only cool black guy in the village and then when someone else comes along they get a little bit like angry and mean because they feel like you might be more interesting or you might take away from the attention that they get because they're the quote-unquote Turk and black person within their group. Which I don't understand because once you're out there in Germany, it's pretty clear that you're in Germany. So no, unless you're Caucasian, you're always going to be looked at as an other anyway. It doesn't matter if you can speak German. doesn't matter if you've got a residence there. doesn't matter if you've got your own apartment there. doesn't matter if you've got a full-time job. doesn't matter if you're working part-time. doesn't matter if you're working cash in hand. It doesn't matter. If you're not white and you're in Germany, you know you're not white. Like, it's just pretty clear. Do you know what I mean? It's pretty bloody clear in that country where you kind of fall in terms of the hierarchy of races. It's pretty obvious. So you would imagine, with that being said, there'd be a lot more kinship because we're all kind of going through the same thing it doesn't matter if you work for innovation doesn't matter if you work for soundcloud doesn't matter if you work in a flip flipping bar if you're somebody that's non-white you're going to go through hell living in that country because it's just difficult and germans are just a little bit you know different than us uk people you'd imagine right it just is what it is but for the most part it isn't like that so that was a very strange and a weird thing but on the positive side of things the older black folks i did meet in there a couple of cool people there's a specifically this one guy that i met whose nickname is spanky for you know read into that what you want he was an absolute diamond really lovely person who i happened to bump into as i was kind of kind of coming back in but uh, but it was really interesting and really saddening for me in general to be in a space like that and to feel as if like there was no comadre or com comadre whatever that fucking term is between people that look like me out there which is dumb i know you shouldn't be seeking kinship of people based off the color of their skin i know it but usually from what i've done with my travels and gone about in places when you see someone that looks like you out in a far-flung place there is a weird connection because for the most part there's not many of you out there so there's definitely gonna be an interesting story of for what brought both of you out there at that at that given moment and for sure that person could give you some words of advice 
point in the right direction between certain things just to kind of you know or maybe just alleviate some of your fears so that you can kind of enjoy your holiday wherever it may be or maybe just say hi and bye whatever it may be but that didn't end up happening so that kind of left me with a sour taste in my mouth which then made me think in general that I might need to give Berlin a break anyway it might not be a Berkheim thing. It might not be a Berlin thing. It might be more so a me thing. Because if I'm really honest, if I'm really, really honest, and I'm really honest, and this is a place I want to be honest in this podcast, the main reason why I used to go to Berlin quite often was primarily to kind of run away from my day-to-day -day life. Because I had so many, I would say, quote-unquote, demons. Because I had such a... Uh, because I was such a crossroads in my life and I was hating my daily existence, I kind of just wanted to black out and not kind of remember what was going on at home. And I kind of used to do that often when I used to go out sometimes as well. I'd kind of get just super blasted to the point where I wouldn't remember just so that I could go back home, wake up and it's 3 p.m. and then start all over again. And I felt like when I went out there, because I was so obsessed and I was such a geek for flipping dance music culture, for DJs, for club culture, I'd, I'd read interviews with founders and architects that design spaces and soundscape designers. And, you know, I'd, I'd go really deep into the whole entire thing, right? I, I remember one time I read the entire back archives of flipping Little White Earbuds, right? Just really engrossed and getting deep into this culture, right? When I went out there, I was automatically like, wow, I get it. I understand why people love this place. I get it, I get it, I get it. But obviously it arrived at such a perfect time for me because I was going through a tough time at home and you go to this place where it's essentially like an adult's playground that allows you to indulge in all your things that you want to indulge in when it comes to nightlife. And it's, it's, effectively, it's, it's a city built off the back of nightlife. It's not really a place that I would imagine you would go to if you're not really a fan of like clubs and whatnot. Generally, it would be a hard place to sort of live in. But overall... I feel as if like now that I'm in a better space in my life that going there as often now as I was before in the past isn't really serving me well. And if anything, it's making me starting to hate a city that I quite highly rate and the people I don't mind either, but I was starting to hate the people. I was starting to hate everyone walking around with a fucking beer in their hand. It's like, bruv, like, do you, what is that? Is that every day's beer time? You can't just have a bottle of water. You can't have a Coca-Cola. You just have to carry a beer in your hand. Like, it's just like, act like you've been here before at least for one moment. Do you know what I mean? That was starting to annoy me. It was starting to annoy me seeing guys with flipping, you know, handlebar moustaches, like sketching in pubs and restaurants and stuff, like illustrating. It's like, what? So this is when you suddenly got an inspiration to turn into fucking Picasso in the middle of a bar. But then I remembered myself, I used to be the guy that would go to Berlin and put, pull up with a flipping book and be reaching and be reading a flipping Nietzsche book in the middle of flipping Neukon so I can't speak about that sort of thing so all of this sort of resentment I'm kind of projecting onto it was maybe because I've realized that oh this place isn't for me anymore but it's also a place that I love and I want to kind of give a chance for me to fall back in love with and maybe to kind of you know in as they say absence made the heart grow fonder maybe kind of space out my times that I go there so instead of going there twice per year three times per year because I think I was actually meant to go there again in July and then go back again in October I'm just going to give it a break for the entire year and just go back again next year so most likely I'll probably do one one trip a year basically I'll be going to um Berlin and stuff and be hanging out there just to kind of get my techno fix and I won't be going there for long I'll just be going there from like Friday until Monday it doesn't even though Ber, you know Ber, Bergheim I think sometimes closes on a Tuesday depending on what time it's open I'm just going to keep it tight get everything done that weekend and just come back home because you know it's not the most beautiful city in the world. Um, there's a lot of poverty around there. Um, it's difficult to kind of watch, especially some of the people in the Turkish community kind of struggle to just kind of, you know, uh, engross themselves in Berlin or German culture overall. There's like a weird thing going on between Turkish people and like Gypsy Romanians or whatnot there too that I, that was kind of witnessed from afar that was strange. I was like, you, you're both looked at, you're both kind of looked down upon, but then they also don't like each other also. But I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's definitely something that's historical and not something that's just based upon what's going on over there. And um, seeing people struggle over there collecting tins and bottles, it's just, it's just, it can, it can bum you out a bit. That's what I'm saying. It can bum you out a bit, especially if you're not like super high and drunk all the time. And then of course, going into one of the best clubs in the world and seeing people who are spending more time in the toilets, you know, taking lines and bumps and whatnot, than actually join the music. That can also bum you out. It's like, you guys queued all this time. I mean, people got turned away for this thing and then all you're doing is spending time just doing drugs the whole entire time. It's like, come on, man. Like, let's, let's do some and then go and enjoy the music and dance, innit? But, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. So that was basically my review of my Berlin trip. But, Moving on to the positives. The positives, the positives, the positives. Number one, of course, the positives, right? The space itself. 
there's no denying that Burkhine is number one, the legitimate best club in the world I've been to from everything that they do with it. Like, you know, going in, in general, I think the whole Q thing, even though I, I spoke smack about how they should probably be, if you're waiting four hours plus, they should probably have a pr procedure or protocol in place where they can maybe go down the line and identify people who they probably wouldn't let in anyway and just say, hey, you might as well just leave now because we're not going to let you in um, just so you can go and continue your night elsewhere. That probably be a good thing to do so they don't have to, so you're not waiting right until you get to the door for them to then end up turning you away. But I still think that whole trepidation of having to wait in the queue behaving yourself not wanting to be seen like you're too drunk or too high not talking when you get closer to the to the door all of those things really kind of add to the overall ambient atmosphere once you get in there because i think much like a really amazing um uh light exhibition that you might go to in an, in an art gallery somewhere where maybe you walk into one part of the room and you're kind of blindfolded or you hear are certain sounds then they take off the blindfold and like to see certain lights and patterns and whatnot i feel like that cue is a way to kind of reset you to kind of reset you back to one so that when you're going in there you're kind of going in there and leaving your kind of old self behind and allowing yourself to just kind of immerse yourself in whatever you see around you not to be freaked out about people hooking up in the dark room not to be freaked out about this weird sculpture about how industrial it looks about the sounds coming at the speakers it just allowed you to kind of put your best foot forward going in there and i feel like when people once they go in there because of the trepidation and the stress of queuing up you go in there and you absolutely let loose and i feel like that's probably the best example i think of a nightclub because most nightclubs in general don't have that kind of feeling most nightclubs are just kind of you know i don't know it's just a dark place you go and hang out but people on the dance floor of burkhine and panorama bar they dance they absolutely dance you never see a bottle or a cup or a glass or a drink on the dance floor everyone's bumping and shaking taking the hips and swaying from left to right no one even at prime but no one's really actually just staring at the dj all the time they're just staring in different directions just having the time of their lives like it's absolutely magical i can't lie it's one of the most magical places to be to to be at in terms of a club space of course when it comes to djs playing specifically what i heard which i thought was really impressive was number one big up josie rebel as being a fellow uk person it was really nice and really kind of heartwarming to see somebody who i I've seen play in the UK in various different places from coming up to like now becoming a world renowned DJ to see her absolutely tear apart Burkheim main room floor was absolutely special she tore it to flipping pieces people were legitimately convulsing when I was at the on the dance floor it was amazing to see so big up Josie Rubel the other person who I thought was amazing that I saw also play was Zakuti, somebody who I mentioned previously who's now a resident now of Panorama Bar in general. So to see her play um, was uh, incredible. She had loads of friends out there also that were kind of cheering her on and stuff. I kind of got to say hi to her for a little bit when she did come into one of the darkroom bits where it's got the air conditioning where I usually end up sitting and kind of regathering my thoughts. So that was cool to see her for a bit. Roy Perez after her was pretty decent. I think I spent most of my time in Panorama to be fair. Roy Perez was pretty decent. I didn't see Boris or Carcita because I then went to go see Etap Kyle Fido. Um, I saw Marcel Dietman back to back with Miss Kitten or Kitten on Oh my God, what a good set. To have that mix between Marcel Dietman, what he plays, which, you'd, which you would say would be your typical techno, and then Kitten playing more so electro type was so, or electro type music was so amazing to hear. Sonically, really, really good. Stylistically, really good too, because they've got very different ways that they mix. Um, they've got very different ways that they kind of pick tunes in terms of their set. So that was pretty cool to see from afar, them working kind of hand in hand. Um, Virginia to close out Panorama Bar perfect but she's always been i think a little bit of an underrated dj overall maybe it's because she doesn't i mean i don't know i can't say enough i can't really read too much about i can't really read too much into it but just from the outside in as as female djs go i reckon she's definitely up there as one of the best in the business but i don't really see her getting spoken about the same way that our people don't get spoken about and i don't know if this is like a she does it on purpose because she doesn't want the fame and she kind of just wants to have like a very because that's the kind of thing i always kind of pictured in my head if i ever became a professional dj i'd want to have a very sort of like i wouldn't say middle of the road but a very considered career where i'd only play at maybe 60 clubs you know around the world 
I'd maybe pick 10 festivals that I really wanted to play at all the time and I just keep recycling them every single year. But it wouldn't be this drive to make sure I get all the big, all the most biggest bookings and play the most far flung places. I don't care. I want to play the places that I respected, the places that I loved as a punter. I loved whatever as a DJ playing there. I love to play in front of the crowd. Like those are the places that I kind of play. And just, you know, just, that'd be my kind of, my safe space, which is still an amazing career to have, to be able to play music in you know some of the best places in the world without having the pressure of being the big awakening festival type person is definitely great but virginia was flipping awesome so big up jennifer sorry big up jennifer big up virginia definitely that was great and then another one who i thought was really amazing who did something i'm kind of kind of quickly noticed i think a lot of people don't really know of was the xxx floor which I, which i'm assuming if i'm not mistaken is the floor that they do um the party that's meant to, that's meant to be specifically for the gay crowd what is it called Oh, I forgot what the party is, but Bergheim have a particular night that they do. I think maybe it's once a year that's specifically for the gay community only, right? And they open up a specific part of the club, which is called, I forgot what it's called as well, the name, oh, it doesn't matter. But I've never been there. So they open up the entire Bergheim. Again, because usually I only go to Bergheim, main room floor in Panorama Bar. This time around, they had every single room of that place open. It was absolutely amazing to see. I walked around the entire space. Great. We went to the garden. It's awesome, awesome, awesome. But they got this other room in there that's that looks like it's out, it's out of a movie or something. Absolutely incredible. People dance on a bar. People dance on top of plinths and speakers. The DJ booth is up in like a cage thing. Like It's incredible. Literally incredible. It might be one of the best spaces I've been to. I've never seen it in my entire life. And Pablo Boozy was playing there, right? And I've seen this guy play a few times on that station called Whore. How do you pronounce it? Hey, H-O-R. With a little with the little markings on top of the O. And he's mostly, I would say, to describe him, an, an Atello disco DJ type thing, right? And I've liked his sets on there. But I was also intrigued to see, like, how would he play in that kind of environment? How would that sound kind of go down? Because, again, when you think of Bergheim, you think of industrial, you think of, you know, really deep, heavy, hard, big room sort of techno. You don't really think of Itello Disco. And let me tell you, Pablo Bozzi tore that room to pieces. To pieces. So much so that I lost a couple of my own possessions in that room. I'm not going to name them. <laughs> you know, if you know, you know. But it was an absolute vibe. It was so much fun. Like, ridiculously fun. And I would definitely go and see him um, live again. So definitely big up Pablo Buzzi when it comes to that sort of stuff. Really, really was one of my highlights in terms of going, especially for the space and everything else that I included in there. But honestly, what a really great night. I'm not going to complain about that one. Then, moving on, another kind of um, one to kind of keep a note on, I'd imagine, just to say, because again, I was really pissed I didn't go to RSO Berlin. But I really recommend, if you go to Berlin, I really recommend to check out some of the more quote-unquote alternative clubs. And one of the best alternative clubs I found out there was this place called Same Heads, which is in Neuklund, which is effectively their version of like Dorsten, I would say, basically. And Same Heads basically reminded me of that like, the heydays of Alibi. Alibi was this famous dive bar in London, or sorry, in East London, in Dorsten, that I used to go to all the time. I basically used to live in there. I used to put, I used to run a club night in there. Like, I was flipping the greatest. I met some awesome people in there. Like just great, the greatest place ever, right? Hell, it's got some. It's got a really special place in my heart because, of course, I kind of you know, basically my entire personality was basically built and crafted in that space to a certain extent. And obviously, that kind of clubs in London, they've kind of gone, they've gone by the wayside through gentrification, through you know noise complaints, council stuff. That those clubs don't really exist anymore for the most part. We don't really have them, but they have this sort of version thing in um in in Berlin called Same Heads, and. If I'm not mistaken, it's actually set up by two British brothers. I remember watching an interview with them on YouTube years ago. And I've always wanted to go there, but I never have, I never can remember because I'm usually always too fucked up. But this time around, because I went there like an adult, I kind of spent most of my time not really drinking or getting high or anything. I kind of just spent my time eating and just kind of chilling out. So I was able to go there and I had a really, really fun time. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't know what the night was called. Um, it was sort of like a an arabian sort of kind of middle eastern electronic type music vibe there was only dj girl djs playing from what i could see um the crowd was extremely mixed like in terms of ages and races and backgrounds which i love i hate going to places that's, that's probably why i had a bit of an a bit of a 
sour taste in my mouth going to Bergheim that time because everyone just looked the same. Everyone's got the double sole Dr. Martens on. Everyone's wearing fucking black bikinis and black fish nets and stuff. It's just a bit boring, right? And jock straps, just like, okay, yawn. But I felt like in same heads, a lot of people had actual personality, were actually interesting people, actually had interesting things to say, did interesting things, blah, 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 blah. blah. And it was such a great vibe in there, honestly, to hear different bits of music that wasn't just techno, to see different people that wasn't just a typical sort of person you'd see playing the nightclub and just in general the space is really cool so from the pictures i've got listed up in here they're a bit crappy but the pictures basically show you type what it kind of looks like so downstairs you've got this sort of room right where it's sort of like just got your standard dj booth here with like a, i guess the back bit where the DJs put their stuff and whatnot and that's a small basement room with the kind of the bar towards the back but then on the top floor it's basically like a standard bar right it's like a classic bar type vibe right and they serve you really cool, cheap drinks and whatnot. And it's just a cool, easy place to hang out. It really is. Really kitschy looking, um, oddly, you know, decorated and furnished and whatnot. Very unassuming from the outside. You pass it, it looks like a furniture, vintage type store. It's really, really cool. And I think after a certain time, they obviously charge for entry. But I think before nine, I think I'm not too sure it's free. After that, you have to pay like nine euros. But honestly, it was legitimately one of my finds of the trip that i went to and again i've known about this club for many many years and i've never got around to going to it because i just spent most of my time going to legitimate like techno raves and whatnot but this was really 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 fun like i can't kind of stress how fun this was and i really had a great time going there so definitely recommend going to same heads if you haven't already checked it out so definitely a recommendation that i put on there in the list and then of course lastly the turkish food there is absolutely phenomenal like it literally puts the turkish food that we have here in london to shame even though we have really good turkish food here in london i feel like the levels of turkish food in Turk in berlin are just on another level every place you go to especially even the shitty ones they're effectively our version of like a seven is that like their version of like a five but i was able to go to a pretty decent one in the middle of like cop or tour that i think might be called tech or something i think it was called tech tech mir tech mir berlin uh turkish i think it was tech mir it was super super tasty really really cheap uh the duna is it tech mir or tech mir tech mir i don't doesn't matter whatever it may be if i find out what the name is i'll put it in the description but definitely a really fun time and i definitely recommend to go check it out if you haven't already next on the list we have talk talk about this so I've, I've i've kind of had a little bit of an issue with tv series out at the moment it feels like everything out at the moment is a little bit crap um, I'm having to struggle to get through a lot of the things just because I've got nothing to watch and if I want to wind down and kind of disconnect from everyday life, I just kind of have to watch whatever's available just because. But I finally finished part one of season four of Stranger Things and I have to say this is legitimately one of the best things out on TV at the moment. And season four might be better than season one and even season two of Stranger Things because I feel like season three kind of fill up a bit of a cliff but i feel like season four this at least part one is legitimately what i've been hoping for in terms of tv series it doesn't take itself too seriously it tells interesting stories from very different perspectives loads of different perspectives actually which i think is something you have to give the guys credit who do maybe the showrunners or the writers in general stranger things they how they're able to tell so many interesting um detailed without being too heady and crazy stories of all these individual characters but then still have them all kind of merge without it coming across corny is really really commendable extremely commendable especially when you imagine that there are what maybe four or five leads that we probably have to focus on but even the auxiliary kind of supporting characters they all kind of contribute to the overall narrative of the story and they do a really good they do a really good job of weaving it all together and then, of course, the plot itself is just brilliant. The development of the characters is fucking brilliant, especially the one person who I really like, um, one of my favourite, the kind of an the antagonist of the entire thing. Again, I'm going to spoil it, so if you don't want to hear it, then please skip ahead. But the antagonist of it, the kind of the the blonde dude who's basically um, number one, who's uh, the lab assistant in the facility where Eleven kind of gets um, trained into being this kind of psychic assassin, 
his character development throughout the entirety of that part one is incredible to see towards the end where he just turns into this kind of sociopathic psycho devil demon satan thing whatever he creature he turns into but it happens over a period of time it's great to watch in real time it's so amazing to see really 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 is but the funny thing is is that actually in terms of characters and the actors Millie Bobby Brown's character, Eleven, she might actually be, she might legitimately be the worst actor in the entire thing, which is strange to think so, because you'd imagine she's basically one of the main leads in it, but she legitimately might be one of the worst actors in there. Apart from when she cries and gets emotional, she's very flat as terms of an actor. I, I don't really enjoy her performances at all. I feel like whenever she's on screen, you notice how bad she is and it kind of takes you out of the trance of watching Stranger Things, which is a bit disappointing. Um, so that's a bit of an error. But again, I think because the other performers are so strong, you notice when someone's really bad. In the same way, you notice how that sort of like overly um, stereotypical black girl fly kind of archetype they put on the little sister of lucas is a little bit cringe and kind of make you want to bath in your mouth but again the actor that plays that role out of this world the only thing that i don't like that hasn't been explained so far is what's going on between these two guys again the characters names don't ask me but if you're watching it you would know what i'm talking about um the character who plays basically 11's boyfriend and then the character who plays 11 11's boyfriend's kind of best friend what's going on between them what what is he trying to say without saying is this guy gay and basically has a hots for him and doesn't want to tell him? Why would he want to tell him if he knows a relationship with Eleven? Doesn't it create some weird, unnecessarily odd um, love triangle between a, a couple of teenagers? I just don't understand the point of this. Like, why Why does this add anything to the story that he has a hots for him? I don't really understand it. It's really, really strange. But anyway, in general incredible series to watch i really am i'm enjoying it i can't wait for part two i really really can't to see how this entire thing ends it's been an absolute breath of fresh air to watch and um may long continue because there's too much i feel like agenda driven tv at the moment there's too many things kind of soaked in politics and you know ideology and whatnot without which essentially unfortunately takes away from the story because there's one thing if you imbue politics and ideology into your tv series and the story is actually good but if it's just going to be laden with politics but the story's crap what's the point do you know what I mean what's the point so definitely check out stranger things if you haven't already because i legitimately think it's one of the best things like hands down one of the best things on tv at the moment and i'm really 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 like and i'm saying this honestly i'm enjoying every last minute of it and i can't wait to watch part two when it eventually does drop Next on the list, we have some very upsetting news um, that I have to kind of mention that I'm really, really, really kind of sad to kind of read, especially when you consider, you know, the role this man played in everyone's life, especially in the UK in terms of urban music and whatnot and whatever it may or it may be. Uh, there's been an update concerning Jamal Edwards, obviously the founder of SBTV, and he's basically re cause of death. And I guess most people were hoping for just a natural cause of death or something or just something unlucky in terms of brain aneurysm or whatever but it's looking like he may have died as a circumstance or as an effect of taking recreational drugs unfortunately this is courtesy of the guardian it says jamal edwards died after taking recreational drugs says his mother um it continues here it says the music entrepreneur and youtube star jamal edwards died from an app from an erythium as a result of taking recreational drugs they don't specif specify what the drugs were but you know because i think it's important to say if you're going to put it out there so people are aware it also is important to kind of specify what the drugs were um but you know again it's their business um so they can do whatever they please to do and we have to we have to be happy with that because again you know just jamal holds a special place in everyone's heart i reckon it continues it also helped launch the careers of ed dave and ed sheridan died in february age 31 brenda edwards singer and loose women panelist said in a statement on tuesday she was in a state of shock after finding out how he died Died. Fuck man. I have sadly learned that the cause of Jamal's devastating passing was due to a cardiac arrhythmia. This was caused by having taken recreational drugs. I want to address this myself to everyone who loved and admired and respected my son. Since finding out the news, I've been in a state of shock. I'm still trying to process it, but it's important for me that I do address it as no matter as the, as no mother or any loved one should go through what Jamal's sister Tanisha and I have been through since he passed. And that's a really sad thing about drugs and in general is that you never know what people are on 
because most of the time people do stuff through behind closed doors especially if you're going through things especially if you're really stressed out or especially if you just don't think everybody around you is going to be accepting all the stuff that you're doing and i feel like in general you know maybe it's just a uk thing but i feel like the conversations that we need to have around drugs i feel like aren't really at a mature place where people would feel comfortable enough to open up about the issues that they're struggling with so they're kind of having to do them behind closed doors and usually doing stuff behind closed doors and not doing them in the open does usually lead to some um you know um risky situations it leads to some errors um to some danger because you're obviously doing it behind closed doors you may be taking more risks in order to conceal and hide your things and in general i feel like doing things in hiding anyway doesn't serve anybody and it would eventually it does come to light it'll be so bad that you know you would kind of wonder why that person didn't come to you sooner so that's a really sad part about it but you know big up the mum for being brave enough to come out and say it because she doesn't owe anybody an explanation i don't think um i don't think jamal's legacy is going to be tarnished by hearing this sort of news it's just upsetting really to kind of hear that somebody so loved and adored was kind of going through whatever he was going through and basically had no other way to deal with it i feel like oh no i feel like oh well, from what i can understand they may be taking recreational drugs that might have eventually led to his passing which is utterly utterly sad it continues the 53 year old released a statement on twitter and instagram after an inquest on her son's death was held at the west london coroner's court the coroner catherine wood said edwards came home late one evening after work and he became increasingly agitated and suffered a cardiac arrest and was deteriorating despite treatment she said after a post-mortem that the re he had, that she had reason to suspect the death is an unnatural death okay but um brent brenda edwards said that he was incredibly touched by the outpouring of love and support that the family had received after jamal's death you're all helping us try to get through the unmanageable she described her son as having the world at his fingertips and his zest for life and was unwilling to be taken away too soon um and it was unwittingly sorry take away too soon Yet we have to come to terms with what has happened and Jamal is proof that this can happen to anybody. These types of substances are extremely unpredictable and we can only hope that this will encourage others to think wisely when faced with, 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 similar, with similar situations in the future. His passing has shown that any one bad decision that any one bad decision on any occasion can lead to devastating consequences. She stressed the importance of helping to drive home conversations about unpredictability of recreational drugs and their impact and how it can take one bad reaction to destroy lives. That's the thing, man. I wish they would specify what the recreational drugs, what the recreational drug was, specifically which one it was. Was it cat? Was it coke? Was it heroin? Whatever it may be, just put it out there so that there is so that we can go into the next phase of this kind of healing process or this overall conversation where people are actually going to be talking honestly about these things it continues i will do anything to have my son back but this is just not possible so if i can help save one life then we will have achieved something she said the inquest heard that jamal edwards died on february 20th on the 20th of february after having a cardiac arrest at his mother's home in acton west london it was adjourned to be resumed in eight weeks time he found fame setting up music platform sbtv in 2006 and was credited with helping to launch a string of uk musicians access stardom he was also a ambassador for the princess trust a charity led by the princess of wales in 2014 he was made an mbe of his services to music his mother's uh, statement said i'm incredibly proud of everything he has achieved over the course of his 31 years i'm so proud to call him my son several of loose women co-parents including jay Moore and judy love left measures of support and support of the reference oh sorry the statement they said um, this must be so painful for you to write wrote nadia Sawala, very brave saying love to you and your incredible children this changes nothing jamal achieved so much he was a damn fine man 100 percent agree with that 100 percent agree with that r.i.p jamal edwards long live the legend long live the legend moving on more distressing and heartbreaking news, especially for myself being a little bit of a fanboy of this guy's music and the crew that he was associated with or part of we i have learned over the last couple of days that hypo one of the main figureheads in mash town a hackney based drill rap garage whatever band or group you'd want to call them who i was utterly obsessed with when i was coming up in school has unfortunately been murdered absolutely horrible and this is courtesy of um the daily mail it says here right yeah yeah the daily mail um man 32 charged with murdering emil sunday's rapper ex-boyfriend hyper which i hate them saying in the headline because he was a legend in his own regard being a rapper he didn't need to be associated with emily sunday even though i know she's super famous i get it but this is a little bit disrespectful but we continue the fernando rapper was stabbed to death during a fight at the platinum jubilee party 
which is crazy, yeah, over the weekend. Um, a 32 year old man is due to appear in court charged with the murder of Emil Sani's rapper ex boyfriend, Hypo. Laurie John Philippe from Enfield, North London, is accused of caught killing the performer whose real name is Lamar Jackson shortly after midnight on Friday. Jackson, 39, whose tracks include Flex on My Ex, First Night, and No L's, was stabbed to death at a party in, uh, what's it thing called? In Woodford Green, um, East London. John Philippe was arrested on Saturday and will appear alongside uh, at Barkinside Magistrates Court on Monday, charged with murder and possession of the bladed article. Allegedly, they're saying that this this murder of a guy who killed Hypo, R.I.P. the flipping goat, was a security guard, which is absolutely insane. How a security guard can get into a scuffle with quote unquote the talent that would lead to him stabbing them. It's just bizarre. But anyway, we continue. Um, John, twisted party goers are said to have filmed the fight which is natural especially in london people are flipping you know the madness that i've seen in parties when when actual craziness is going on is just unbelievable with at least one recording at the moment medical officers attempted to resuscitate the rapper before callously sharing a clip online sparking fear on social media hypo recently got engaged had reportedly got into a trivial row at the party being held in a large marquee before being fatally stabbed so a random, so what? They were arguing over football or something, cr crazy. Which led to his death, crazy, isn't it? Um, obviously pictures of him and Sandy back in the day. Pictures of him, how he most recently looked that way. It continues here. Um, in the hours before his death, the leading figure of Mashtown Rappers Collective, based in East London, filmed himself being driven in the Bentley on the way to the event, an Instagram story shared with his 23,000 plus followers. The performer is only known by stage name, later filmed himself rocking sunglasses and smoking while dancing inside. Scottish singstress Emily um, and Hyper dated for a year before splitting in 2017. In March 2016, they enjoyed a trip to Jamaica together with a source. At the time, Kevin had given the Aberdeen Bonsai a whole new way of inspiration. Hyper grew up in Islington, North London. is said to have had a traveled path but pals have said he mellowed out in recent years as he focused on his music career. Tributes have poured in from friends and fans online in the wake of his news of his death. Hypo is a pioneer in the industry, said one year the fan on Twitter. Met him a couple of times. He was a clean hearted guy. The world is crazy. Another said, RIP Big Hypes. Very sad and news to wake up. We lost a real one. One described the death as a tragedy, adding in his Instagram story, he's just living the best life, having fun. Later the same day was taken and it's taken from him. And of course, this is you know what Hypo was on back in the day. But yeah, um, it's troubling and it's upsetting on one side, but it's also, I would say, not surprising because I would say the unfortunate side of like being a bad man and being on it and being about that action and always being on go time is that sooner or later, someone's going to test you a gangster. That's the unfortunate side of things. But it's also pretty clear to me, especially as somebody who hasn't actually been a gangster himself, that the people who actually are on that time they always end up in jail or they always end up dead. And the other exception is that they end up looking like Young Spray. If you've seen Young Spray in real life, he legitimately looks like a child um, soldier. Like he's covered in scars. Like he looks like he's been through the wars legitimately. Like that guy has lived like a life. Yeah, I mean, he must have stories upon stories upon stories about being chased, about being stabbed, about being rushed. About, you know what I mean? Like he's, he's been through it. Um, in and out of prison, all that sort of stuff. So you end up either being you know you ever either been dead you ever end up being in jail or you end up looking like young spray where you legitimately have lived a hard life but it's very rarely that you're a bad man you're a wicked man you're on that kind of time and you're still about just living life it doesn't happen the, only, the other example of somebody who i was again a big fan of which i don't know why i have a, an affinity or likeness for these type of rappers but another one of my favorite grammy MCs coming up was escobar right and he was from a crew called slew them and i used to see him all the time around like leighton stone forest gate east stam stratford that kind of area and he was always on go time. Like he'd be walking up and down with his head cocked up, like looking at anybody, staring in, like looking for too long. It'd be a situation. But he was always on go time. There's legendary stories about him fighting everybody. And eventually that caught up with him too because someone tested his gangster and boom, he ends up passing away. And I think that's just the unfortunate nature of being that kind of person. And it, feel, and it looks like if you're that person, it's very rare that you just kind of dial it back and become like a normal dude. You always have that little bit of a rage in you that can kind of just go at any time. And because you know you're actually on that time, you look at everybody else like donuts. I mean, everyone else is a neek to you. Like, how dare you even speak to me? Do you know who I am? Do you know what work I've done? Do you know what, what I've put in? Do you know what blood I've spilt for this thing? And now you're coming up to I mean, like, you don't get it. It can't process for you, man. So that's why we have to give people like 50 Cent. Weird example, but 
people that have to get given their flowers because it's very rare that you go from being go time guy action dude to suddenly transitioning into just being like a businessman it's very strange that that happens you can kind of just turn it off because it feels like most people can't turn it off um but also maybe it's just a straight up envy thing that might be no situation it might just be like hypo was legitimately one of the most you know him and asco again from 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 mash town um you know force and prayers go out to asco being in prison hearing the news of hypo being stabbed and dying and shit. that must be horrible to learn you know one of your crew members has passed away in prison like that but him and asco were the two we should say bossiest like flossiest kind of rappers in the uk and people that i see in real life who are driving like lambos and bentleys and had like american style chains on it was just wild to see in real life like god damn it diamonds dancing i mean just like living that best life who knows how they got their money i'm not interested i don't give a fuck but just watching it from the outside in as a fan was crazy to see and again you know, with Asko, he ends up in prison because he's, you know, being, being accused and found guilty of running an international, running a county lines drugs crew or line, whatever, operation. And then, of course, Hypo, at a flipping jubilee party, gets stabbed to a point where he has to die. It's just flipping sad and really crazy to see that happening in real time. But R.I.P. Hypo, man, honestly, legitimately one of my favorite rappers coming up and personalities overall. Um, always loved his energy, always loved what he brought to Mashtown. Um, again, Mashtown, I think, were a very under rated crew overall they definitely didn't achieve the success i felt like they should have achieved especially for the um level of talent they had in their crew um but yeah man gone but not forgotten to the legend that is hypo gone but not forgotten moving on we have news courtesy of variety which i thought was pretty decent and pretty interesting and pretty cool um it says the following julia garner offered madonna role in universal biopic Obviously, in terms of looks, I think that she would absolutely smash the role. The only thing that I'm a little bit sussed about is her overall uh, body composure, her movement, her lack of coordination. Because I felt like um, when she plays, um, what is it called? Is it Ruth Gilmore or whatever she plays in Flipping Ozarks and you see her walking all the time. She's got a little bit of a knock knee thing going on. She doesn't look like the most um, graceful person in the world. And I'm just wondering if you're going to play Madonna in her heyday when she used to do like crazy choreographed routines and her live shows were insane. You just have to have a bit of a two-step in you. you know what I mean, you're going to have to have a bit of a shoulder shuffle in you. You're going to have to be too, able to hit some angles. You can't, just do that all with a body double. It has to be, or unless they just do a whole entire biopic about Madonna and don't include any of her dancing. It's just because I'm imagining Madonna's got a flipping interesting story to tell. A lot of it probably occurred off the stage anyway. So maybe that's the that's the thing. That's a, that's the only really kind of um, draw like I'd have in it. But regardless, let's continue with the article. It says as follows: Inventing Anna actress Julia Garner. It's interesting they they call her Inventing Anna, not Ozarks. Because I think her role in Ozox is far better. Anyway, continues. Julia Garner has been offered the role of Madonna in the forthcoming biopic. Garner has emerged as a favourite from the other dozen con candidates. One insider added, and has for and has for months been so speculated as a frontrunner for the part. A performance Madonna would spit was shepherd herself as director. Garner's team is considering and expected to accept this offer, said another source. The film is set up at Universal Pictures and will follow the early days of the oft-controversial artist Queen of Perpetual Reinvention. Universal filmed, Uni Universal filmed Entertainment Group chairman Donna Langley wrote, wrote one the script in a multi-studio bidding war and Amy Pascal is attached as producer. And the production uh, timeline and other principal cars is still unknown. Actors in contention for the role included a previously reported Florence Pugh. Oh, okay, interesting. Alexa Dima to be Madonna. That's a bit weird. Odessa Young, singers Bebe Rexa, and Sky Freire have also been floated. Sky Freire is a play Madonna in a biopic. As an actor, I don't know about that one. Bebe Rexa, I think, could do it. She's definitely got a bit of a Madonna look about her. Um, she maybe has to lose a bit of weight, but she definitely could do it. The auditioning process was reportedly grueling as a music heavy production requires a skilled singer and dancer. Okay, maybe Julia Garner can dance then. I'll take it back. Upon announcement, Madonna said she hoped that convey the incredible journey that life has taken me as an artist, a musician and a dancer and a human being trying to make a way in the world. The focus on the film will always be music. Music has kept me going and art has always kept me alive. There are so many untold inspiring stories and who better to tell them than me? The essential part of the role the roller coaster ride of my life with my voice and my vision as an artist myself and as a creative myself a part of me thinks that when it comes to biopics if the person's alive they should always have some sort of say um, and input into how a film about them gets presented 
another part of me as an artist and as a creative would think in order to tell an actual story an interesting story you'd have to take the person that's obviously you're talking about take them as far away as possible from the project and tell whatever story you can tell as the writer as a producer as a director as a showrunner right like you tell your version of the story. it's not going to be the right story it's not going to be the correct story the finished story because that person's lived the life it's pretty difficult to kind of rewrite history or to basically record every moment of your life you know what i mean it's just difficult to do in the first place so you're only going to tell every story every version of the story that they're telling you whether it's for an autobiographical book whether it's for an autobiographical movie whatever it may be it's always going to be told in a particular sort of tilt or lens it's never going to be exactly the, the story so it would be nice to maybe have seen a movie where Madonna wasn't in heavily involved because you never know how crappy it's going to end up. But who knows? Maybe this might end up being a good thing. But I'm just happy for Julia Garner anyway. I think she's an incredibly, incredibly, incredibly good actress. And I think she's going to absolutely smash this. Uh, again, like I said, I'm not sure if she can dance or shit. But if they're saying the audition was grueling and she passed it with flying colours and they're offering it to her and they're announcing it in the press before she even agreed to it, it means that they really want her to take the role. They're putting pressure on her in a big way to accept it because they really think she's perfect for it. So let's see how this turns out. Let's see how this turns out next moving on i want to speak about these shoes that everyone seems to be going goo goo gaga over which i don't get and i don't think look that great personally it's just a personal opinion don't kill me for having one but i think nike and jordan brand get away an absolute murder when it comes to um the vintage well, when it comes to the jordan shoes that they put out especially when it comes to vetros so the shoe that i'm talking about at the moment is the what, what what are they labeling it as if i'm going back to the tab here they're labeling it as the chicago reimagined so effectively what jordan brand are doing now is they're taking the you know the the very famous jordan brand silhouette they're taking the chicago colorway one of the favorites or one of the most hyped and lauded and loved colorways of a jordan one brand of sort of the of the jordan one and they're basically reimagining it as a vintage shoe with updated basically materials and whatnot so basically what they're doing is this version of what Adidas did with the with the forum highs and the lows and whatnot, where they basically took um, the retros and basically made them look vintage, but they went really far in terms of the shape, in terms of the vintage application. Everything on it is like extreme to the point where if you weren't educated in sneakers and you're just a lame person looking at it, you'll just look at them and you think, wow, these might actually be oh geez they kind of pulled out from you know the archives or some collector somewhere in the middle of switzerland and these are legitimately from the 80s but they're not they're legitimately retro that they've made nowadays but they were able to make them to spec and close to what they actually look like if you actually was to buy a vintage one that you'd kind of be mistaken for thinking that they were vintage and now jordan brown doing the same thing with the edge of the one oh high og chicago reimagined but for me personally speaking i feel like these are pretty crap in terms of how they relate to the forums and what i did with these i just don't think they marry up in at all and i feel like jordan brand kind of didn't really go as far as they could do in terms of the shape in terms of the materials in terms of the application in terms of the finish it just doesn't look that impressive personally for me and i feel like this is another example of just them i wouldn't say take it's not taking advantage of the of the of the retro consumer but it's just a lack of understanding of the consumer that you do have because these are effectively made for sneakerheads like myself they're made for people who collect sneakers they're made for people that who give a shit about when stuff's released they're made for people who look in tired of tongues and read you know size tag labels people who go on ebay and scour places like japan yahoo J yahoo jp auctions to find crazy stuff or go to mom and pop stores or travel across the country to different shops to find rare and vintage products this is made for us so if it's made for us, why not make it to spec? Go as far as you can do in terms of production, in terms of finishing, in terms of application, whatever it may be, go as far as you can, charge a premium price for a premium product and let us buy them. But no, what they've effectively done is just taken a regular, what looks like to me, Jordan brand silhouette in terms of the Jordan 1 high and they've just basically made them try to make them look old by staining the tongue a little bit by making the upper sort of black collar here towards the top look crinkled to kind of give it the impression that it's a vintage shoe and maybe they stained the midsole here and there but in terms of the finish in terms of the shape compared to what i was able to do with this oh with this kind of forum right in terms of how 
the suede stripes here on the side of the forearm have that kind of wafty, that kind of um, fluffed up, bubbled texture towards them. Um, the staining here on the midsole, the staining on the collar of the forearm, of the strap, the laces and how they end up looking. Like they legitimately look like shoes that you could have found in 84 that have just been sold nowadays. Like legitimately look like that. They look absolutely brilliant. I'm actually surprised the forearm isn't as a big, as a popular shoe as it should be nowadays. I don't know what the deal is about it, but for whatever reason, it hasn't really captured people's imagination. And Ada seems to have been keep trying to make these a thing, but people just don't seem to be vibing with them i don't really know because they look pretty pretty sick to me personally especially when it comes to just a classic um you know mostly white basketball sneaker that can be worn as a casual shoe it's really perfect i feel like but for a reason it doesn't resonate and now we have some updated pictures of the jordan and it's i still maintain that they're pretty average and that they have done the bare minimum in terms of making them a quote-unquote reimagined shoe. But they're still going to be insanely popular. They're going to sell out. They're going to be all over the place. They're going to be resold for crazy amounts of money. But I just feel like they still haven't really kid it out of the park. These are still kind of shit, personally for me. It just looks like a regular Jordan brand, a regular Jordan 1, with maybe some improvements on the leather. But in terms of the shape of them, like I would imagine the tooling is no different to what you'd get from a Jordan if you'd buy it from Foot Locker, or if you'd buy it from Sneakers and stuff or buy them from Essence, whatever it may be. It's still the same tooling. And maybe the only thing they've done is that the finishing has been somehow different. But again, is the finishing on them that much better than what I, I just have been able to do on a consistent basis? And the reason why I keep saying this is because remember when I used to work at Nike, when I used to work with these trendy sneaker stores back in the day when I was part of the, you know, of the culture and I was really giving a shit of being involved and whatnot. One of the things that I kept getting told by people in the know who actually worked behind the scenes, the reason why they couldn't retro shoes properly, Nike had a really bad reputation of retroing shoes terribly. You think about the Nike Air Stab, right? Nike Air Stab. You think about the, uh, yeah, and the good, the good example is a Foot Patrol one. Absolutely great color, one of the greatest colorways of all time, but that model was abs but that color was absolutely wasted on the model because the model was absolutely garbage, right? So they wasted it, made the model look completely horrible. And they're wondering why, oh, it's not horrible, it's really good. No, it is horrible. Look at what the vintage one looks like. The vintage air stab looks absolutely incredible, right? That's the vintage one he's wearing there. It looks incredible there and there compared to the retro that actually came out. It looks absolutely bulbous and terrible, but the absolute vintage one, the real one that actually came out back in the day, looks incredible in terms of shape. Another real big faux pas in terms of retros for Nike was the Air Max Lite, which I still have never, 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 never forgiven um, Nike for, for absolutely torturing and butchering this retro. It looks completely horrible compared to what it actually is meant to look like. Get up on here, the Air Max Lite, right? Look, look at how amazing that shoe is actually meant to look like. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the actual OG version. Or maybe it's not. Or maybe it's the one that people actually stained back in the day. But there's a... Let me see if I can find an actual OG version that someone's got. Yeah, this is that kind of actual OG. That one's an actual OG. This one's an actual OG. And they look completely different. And even this, to com compare to the shape, what it actually like end up coming up looking like, right? So completely horrible, completely crappy done. Now, when I was coming up in sneakers, I was told the reason why they aren't able to make... Um, OGs or they aren't able to make retros to the exact specifications as vintage shoes was because the tooling the whatever they use to make the 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 kind of form or the shape of the actual shoe it's way is really expensive like the tooling to make the shoe the the mold wherever it may be is like i don't know in the thousands so to remake the tooling would cost them so much money that they probably maybe are afraid they wouldn't get back or whatever it may be which I don't really buy because nowadays the sneaker industry or the sneaker market is a billion dollar industry. Everyone and their mum is basically a sneakerhead because everyone can get limited edition shoes. Um, for the advent of, you know, with the popularity of Yeezys and what not happening in the industry, it's fairly easy to say that everybody and their mum knows what a limited edition sneaker is. So if that's the case, there's more people out there buying sneakers than ever before. So this idea that you're not going to be able to sell them is crazy, right? You're not be able to make your money back is insane. So why not just make the shoe to spec, make it with the highest level of quality of materials and then try and sell it to sneakers like myself to, with a higher markup price and we'll still buy them out, but they don't do it. They just do the bare minimum. And what we have here, in my opinion, is just a standard Jordan 1 with maybe some improvements on the materials and the finish, but it's not really what I envision, what they sold it to be because they sold it to be this. 
they sold it to be what Adidas did with the forum, where they were able to take a forum, and even this is just like a classic one, but they took the forum and they were able to update it. No, they're able to basically remake it as a vintage shoe in the modern era. Like that's a good example. This one, like this, in terms of what they're able to do. Maybe there's more scuffing on there. I don't really know what difference, but in terms of what Jordan Brown representing here with the Chicago reimagined, and what Adidas are doing with the Forum, it's night and day. Like in terms of quality, in terms of finish, night and day. They literally, you know, what I mean, stealing a living with this shit. I just don't understand why. Like, because it's again, like I said, these are gonna be sold to sneakheads only. They're gonna be sold to resellers only. They're gonna be sold to Jordan fanatics only. And these, all these people, the one thing that kind of unites them all is the one thing of like really really good high quality sneakers if that's the case give them what they want make high quality sneakers invest as much money as you can to making them premium into making a finishing top grade and then try and sell it to us and most likely we'll buy them but as it is now i just think they're garbage they're obviously going to sell because everyone's you know got a boner for jordan brand shoes and especially retros nowadays but in terms of the finish in terms of what was promised in terms of what i imagined them to look like they look nothing like what was promised and i feel like adidas do a far better job a far better what would you call it a far better respectful job in honoring their great shoes from the past than what nike do they just churn out the same old shit they make you limited they make you wait they make you take putting your name in a flipping raffle and like a picture and retweet this and all this sort of nonsense to have the chance to buy a pair when effectively all the shoes are the same just in different colorways and it's absolutely starting to piss me off i'm not gonna lie it's starting to piss me off it really really is man like come on man jesus christ um next on the list here we have by the bing by the boom we have these now i first i'm surprised i kind of like these and i'm surprised they kind of um tickled my fancy but i guess ever since i kind of broke my converse um chuck 70s cherry by my purchase of the denim tears jo converses joints that i bought a while ago that i've worn excessively and i love to ride around my bike with wearing them and i generally do think they're an absolutely bouncing of a shoe it's allowed me to kind of um to be a little bit more um open to to wearing converses in general even though my feet don't usually fit suit them because my foot's really wide and whatnot i still think there are a decent enough shoe to add to my overall arsenal of sneakers and stuff that would make the stuff that i wear more interesting and this of course is an official look at the stussies and converse chuck 70s high and i think they look great because they've just they've just basically done them in the classic sort of makeup or mock-up in terms of the dark navy or black upper with the contrasting white stitching the blue line on the foxing on the midsole along the outside and then on the side where it's meant to have the converse one star logo they've got the alternative star stushy logo down the side which i think is a really really nice touch actually no take that back the star is meant to be from converse and i think they've added the dots around it to make it look more stussy or they've got whoever illustrates for stussy to make this i don't know what it is maybe i think stussy doesn't have a star sign pretty sure it's not it's stussy star stussy star logo is it they do have a star logo too i'm pretty sure it's just a script oh they do have a star logo okay i didn't know that do they have a star logo or am i bugging out no they don't, yeah they, they don't have a star logo yeah that's not the same star is that or there's a star written at the top there maybe yeah maybe 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 true maybe not who actually knows but i think this um where is it there you go where is it there you go there i think this one star looks really great they're available in a high and of course in the low i'm definitely gonna go for the high because that's all i usually wear but i think they look absolutely great oh actually the lows look really cool too don't they it depends actually when, I, when once i see them maybe worn on foot a little bit more often they might be in a decision to make in terms of which ones i end up getting but i do like the highs i think the highs look so clean that's definitely a shoe you have to maybe double up on i feel like these will get a lot of wear um day to day um, they go with a lot of outfits and again they're probably one of the most comfortable shoes i've worn um they look really steezy do you know what i mean i'm a big fan of the chuck 70s man really really big fan and i'm glad that they somewhat fit me in terms of the ones i already purchased but they look really really good it's like a denim upper canvas upper i'm not really too sure with the metal eyelets i'm not really too fan of the metal eyelets in general but hey we move we accept but i hate i kind of hate metal eyelets personally for me i feel like they kind of just create too much space 
on the on the, top, on the front of your foot once you're looking down. Do you know what I mean? Just space out your laces too much, personally, for me. There's too much room and give around them once they're in there, personally. I much prefer them to just have, like, regular eye, eye holes, like, cut into the fabric or whatnot. Do you know what I mean? To kind of keep the, the socks... Sorry, to kind of keep the laces a little bit more taut. Oh, the nice little detail here, too. They've got a little um, label on the back of the seam on the Stussy Converses, which is pretty cool to see. And, of course, they've got a little Stussy monocare there on the inside of the tongue as well but yeah these look really really impressive i'm not going to lie really really impressive i'm impressed with the entire collection i definitely get the highs first i'm not too sure it's gonna be pop most popular maybe the lows but i think the highs are in the boom being more, more popular i'll get the probably the highs and maybe the lows another time but i think they look really really good definitely something i'm definitely up for checking out and of course they've got a video too that features something regarding the shoes see if we can play that if it's not copyright music Okay, there's a guy riding on his bike holding a surfboard on the way to the beach another kid doing wheelies on his bike onto the, towards the beach I like that nowadays I feel like there's a lot of adverts now where there's a lot of like onus on like exploration and outdoors and quote unquote touching grass there's less of, less of just posing for the posing sake there's a lot of like you should go out and actually be outdoors which is cool to see that actually being something that's being promoted but yeah Converse and Stussy they're going to be in stores okay this Friday wow already dropping super super soon so if you've got the availability the availability or the possibility to purchase the pair definitely make sure you keep your you know your flipping what you call it your Stussy tag or Stussy tab sorry open to be able to kind of check those out when they do eventually drop but yeah the, the highest for me are definitely the standout definitely 100% the standout definitely something that I'd wear I'd wear instantly instantly once it drops but hey what do I know what do I know let's see oh my god let's see let's see let's see let's see okay cool so what else we got to talk about here uh i think that might was that might be it before we kind of peace out here let's see if there's anything more i want to talk about quickly before i leave you guys to it please bear with me one second uh, oh yeah this is last thing last thing quickly just mention is this it is courtesy of this is courtesy of the one and the only instagram account that i like to follow in terms of sneaker news it is over under and this is featuring the gucci adidas gazelles and i want to just point this out because and this is courtesy of sean Wither witherspoon's i guess profile account but this is why i think in general it's really important about how sh shoes particularly i don't know why it is with sneakers or trainers whatever it may be right there's something about it in general or about them where they have to be pictured in a certain way to actually make them look good i feel like when the shoes are given to like random chinese websites and like resellers and you know public online publications are hype based high snobiety they do a really bad job of taking the pictures and capturing the beauty of the shoe or making them look desirable especially when they start doing that thing where they have the shoes hanging on the laces they make the person do the pink the, the tippy toe sting make them jump make them pin roll like all this really weird annoying stuff that i don't feel like actually makes a shoe wearable it just makes them look lame and corny now the adidas and gucci collection i've already come out and stuck my neck out and said i like them anyway but I feel like these pictures from Sean Wotherspoon, which are just casual pictures of him taking a picture of him wearing either pair of the blue with the yellow stripes gazelle and then the gazelle covered in the kind of Gucci mono, mono, monogram from just above, just him casually taking a picture of him wearing either shoe on either foot from above, is going to sell way more than any official imagery he has put out. 100%. Because these look way better on foot than they have done on kind of 2D flat kind of images. Which makes you wonder what they do when it comes to seeding because it feels like when it comes to seeding nowadays they try to get people's things as soon as it drops or maybe after it drops which by that time it's like who cares do you know what i mean if anything maybe drop them before they drop to people that you want to wear them make a commitment that they wear them for a set period of time and then you can revisit later on but i feel like the the gucci adidas because especially the one with the monogram print all over it and it's got the double g's from i think the gucci ghost or whatever written on the side of the mid so i didn't even check that out that looks absolutely impressive and really 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 cool yeah really really cool altogether i really really i'm a big fan of them i think they look absolutely fantastic and like i said previously i think 
a lot of brands, a lot of online publications would do a lot, a lot of themselves some good if they actually gave the shoes to people who actually have swag, who have swag, who have swag, who have personal style, who can actually know how to wear stuff well and make them look cool, and definitely do that going forward because I feel like these Gazelle Adidas are definitely going to end up being a, a big winner when they do eventually end up coming out because they look absolutely brilliant here, like really, really good. Personally, I think they look absolutely amazing. It's funny what they called, isn't it? What they called, I think they called Danger or something, right? Is it what they called? Um, Adidas Gazelle Danger or something. I remember someone talking about it here on the comments, but it doesn't really matter. Who cares? But yeah, you've seen them anyway, regardless. Um, if you are interested in them, they're coming out very, very soon. Anyway, that's been the Yes and Zing Show episode number 582. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. If it's the first time you tuned into a show, please make sure you like and subscribe. If you no, or if you want to check back into a show, you can subscribe. If you want, if you liked it, obviously you like it. If you want to check out my Patreon, you can too. Although I haven't updated this since the last time I did the podcast, so don't check it until I do update it. But that's available in my show description notes, which is called patreon.com for Agostino. You can get you know memberships and unlock everything that i do on there into the vip stuff a little as one pound the equivalent of one dollar so definitely jump on board if you haven't already jump on board but yeah it's been a pleasure to have your company thanks so much for tuning in if you listen to the show via the audio podcast you hear an amazing tune of the day of the week that i have playing and if you're watching the youtube video you want to hear or see anything it'll just go black and i'll be out of here peace